Warren quips, I should put his quote up there, that you get the shareholders you deserve. Good, bad, or ugly. And Berkshire has invested enormously over five decades in getting a very high quality group of shareholders who understand this culture. That shareholder is long term, it's okay with a diversified, acquisitive model, um, and all the other peculiar features of Berkshire. It's a very unusual company, it's a very unusual group of shareholders. Let me count the ways. First of all, the ways that Berkshire shareholders are unusual. First of all, they are most, mostly individuals. At most companies in corporate America, the equity is owned by institutions. Three quarters of the equity of, public, uh, of, of large public companies is owned by institutions, and only 25% by individuals. At, at Berkshire, it's almost the other way around when you count Warren's stake. Even without counting Warren's stake, 40% of Berkshire, both the voting power and the economic interest, is owned by individuals, making institutional investors at Berkshire less important. At most big companies today, financial giants own, like these own large blocks that together dominate, 60, 70, or something like that percent. But at Berkshire, they only control about 10% of the uh, vote and 15% of the economic interest. Only Warren owns more than 5% of the premium class A stock. Fidelity comes close at 4%. On the class B, there are three giants that own more than 5%. But because the Class V has lower voting rights, they only have 3.5% of the vote. And their investment rationale is formulaic. They're not fully engaged investors. They own, they run index funds, and so they have, this is the top three there, Fidelity, Vanguard, I mean, uh, Vanguard, uh, BlackRock, and State Street, they have to own the Class B. Unlike in most um, large American companies, uh, Berkshire has a very visible and substantial group of institutional investors who are boutique, boutique firms who've owned Berkshire for decades, have very long time horizons, and often cater to families. Together, this cohort owns about 7.5% of the vote and 5% of the economic interest. These are famous firms. The top three there have owned large chunks of Berkshire for, since the 1970s. Um, and the next three or four have owned large chunks of Berkshire since the 1980s, and many of the principals in these firms contributed to our book. Berkshire also boasts very high insider ownership and has done since the 1980s. There's, is that the fun picture of the board of directors having, what, is, what are they drinking, Stephanie? Those are milkshakes, okay. I thought they were Dairy Queen something or other, but they're just old milkshakes. But look at what fun they're having. Um, and it's not just because they own the stock, it's really fun to work at Berkshire. Again, not counting Warren, these guys have nearly 5% of the vote and 5% of the economic interest. Several of these people have interests that run to the billions of dollars. Most Berkshire managers have significant portions of their net worth in Berkshire stock, which runs to millions. There are, fam there are important families uh, that are Berkshire owners including numerous members of many of the families who sold their interests in Berkshire over the years, whether in, some small, in a small number of cases receiving stock in the sale, but in a lot of the cases taking the cash proceeds and buying the stock. Uh, a lot of this leads to the tax question, which is uh, underappreciated but vital about Berkshire shareholders. Most capital in the United States is controlled by institutions whose performance is measured pre-tax or who are tax exempt like foundations and pension funds. And so that group, three quarters, um, are tax neutral. It's not, not, not that important to them. Um, at Berkshire, it's essentially the other way around. Almost everybody <laughs> cares a great deal about the taxes, certainly all the directors, certainly all the managers, and a lot of those families. They're, they're tax conscious, and I, I, I call them. And that difference, a huge difference, helps explain Berkshire's unique dividend policy. It has not paid a dividend since 1967. In 2014, the shareholders overwhelmingly voted against a dividend. Most large American companies pay a cash dividend regularly and the shareholders welcome it. Why is Berkshire different? Well, for one, Berkshire has been able to reinvest each dollar of earnings to obtain corresponding gains in market value. But as important, dividends increase taxable income for most Berkshire shareholders. By having Berkshire reinvest the pre-tax dollars, the shareholders' after-tax returns grow. They grew galactically in the first three or so decades when returns were sky high. 
but they've grown still significantly in the past couple and probably will in the next couple despite Berkshire's enormous size. And when you comp continue to reinvest those tax deferred dollars year on year end, year in and year out, capital compounds at much faster rate, accumulating vastly greater wealth for stockholders. Put vividly, to do as well with dividends, a shareholder would need to earn twice what Berkshire owns, which few can achieve. Uh, institutional investors diversify their portfolios very widely because risk reduction is a very important part of their investment strategy. They rarely allocate more than 5% of their portfolios to any individual company's stock. Berkshire shareholders tend to concentrate in Berkshire stock because they prize its higher long-term returns. For instance, half of the 100 largest publicly disclosed Class A Berkshire shareholders have more than 5% of their portfolio in this stock. Today's institutional investors challenge managers to divest subsidiaries and focus on a single business. That contrasts sharply with that map I showed you with Berkshire's sprawling, diversified, opportunistic acquisition strategy and its commitment to permanence, which would make selling off subsidiaries repugnant at Berkshire Hathaway. At most public companies, annual letters are, to shareholders are ghostwritten and ignored, properly so. Buffett personally pens his, and the shareholders gobble them up. Parents send them to children to provide some education in business and finance. Corporate annual meetings are usually time drains, and few shareholders attend them, while shareholders is a packed intellectual, cultural, and social extravaganza. For those who haven't been, that's the arena where the meeting has been held for the last decade, drawing 30,000, 40,000, who knows how many tens of thousands this year. The annual reports are surrounding that picture, 10 or so of them. Why do people read this letter? Why do people go to this meeting? That's the question we ask our 43 contributors to ponder. And here's the table of contents of the book. And I want to thank Jim for giving you all a book tonight. Um, you can look at the screen or look in your copy uh, and you start to get a sense of the answers to these questions. And certainly the economic success has played a role. It's drawn a lot of shareholders and made a lot of shareholders extremely wealthy. But that's not the main reason people go to this meeting year after year after year. The main reason is, is the literal meaning of the word company. It means other people coming together. People go for the fellowship, to meet each other, to talk to each other, to learn from each other, to become friends, to be partners. They go for the events that have proliferated around the meeting. And the resulting sense that they're part of Berkshire culture. Glance at the story titles in, in chapter one, you start to get a sense of the spirit of the meeting and of the Berkshire shareholder. J Jason Zweig, he's a columnist for the Wall Street Journal, is called You're Not Alone. And that stresses the point that Berkshire is a company. It's a family, it's a community, it's a culture, it's a group. Steve Jordan, who's a reporter at the Omaha World Herald's piece, is called He's Just Like Us. And that, that's that autonomous, decentralized, non-hierarchical aspect of Berkshire culture. We're all together in this. In chapter two, partners, we call it. This is about that feeling of mutual bonding. And they, people regale us with stories about how they met so-and-so and how that led to this business opportunity or this investment idea or this book idea. And they've formed lifelong friendships around this for 10, 20, 30 or more years. And it all started with Warren. Here's an iconic image from the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. Again, there are 40,000 people in an arena and there are two people sitting on the podium answering questions for six hours all day. Who's sitting there? It, it's not the CEO flanked by a board of directors uh, as you typically see at an IBM annual meeting or something like that. No, it's Warren sitting there with his best friend since 19, 1959, who he calls his business partner. And they're sitting there fielding questions all day from people who they consider their business partners. Chapter three stresses that the Warren Buffett shareholder is an avid reader. For the past two decades, Buffett has designated a few dozen books for sale in the annual meeting, adding to 120 different titles. There's a scene 
from the center of the convention coliseum stocked with merchandise from all the Berkshire companies and including this little book stand uh, and people swarm this scene to buy these books. Many of these designated books are written by authors who contributed to ours and we're very honored to have them in our group. We're particularly honored that uh, several others have endorsed it. Um, and I guess above all, we're honored that Warren has chosen this book for inclusion starting in this year's annual meeting. And when we got that news, I started to cry. Um, he really he thinks the book's terrific and thinks we're onto something. Uh, I hope I don't jinx it by saying that we even think that this year our book is going to be the 3D mock-up, like the one, one, or the, one, of the, one of the two shown, one of the two shown here. Thanks, Jim. So that's, that's going to be a photo opportunity for any of you who want to join us in, in Omaha. Uh, at the meeting, the typical Berkshire shareholder has read the letter like a good student, comes to the meeting, prepared to discuss it. There are breakout sessions where people debate it. Most people posing questions from the meeting floor ask good ones. Uh, and Berkshire shareholders applaud when they hear a good question. Some of them ask dumb questions, and the Berkshire shareholders hiss and boo uh, when, they, when they hear ignorant questions. It's, you know, it's a little like a really good uh, university seminar uh, that Jim conducts, uh, or that I, I sometimes I hope to conduct. Warren has, has built a culture around this. Is, uh, Warren is the leader in this. For decades, he's created events all around. The, the meeting occurs on Saturday. He's designed events like a, a baseball game on, on Friday night where, that we all went to, a, a, a barbecue at, on Saturday after the meeting at the, at the local furniture mart store, and, and a big party all day Sunday at the local jewelry store that, that Berkshire Hathaway owns. He started all this, and over the past 10, 20, 30 years, Berkshire shareholders have started their own subculture all around this. And the stories in our book are by the people who started some of these events, why they started these events, what they mean, what has happened here. And just to give you some highlights, Tom Gaynor, who is the co-CEO of Markel Corporation, talks about how 30 years ago he went to the meeting, had a brunch for six people, and his meetings, his, his brunches now draw a thousand. Borsheim's, that furniture store, that uh, jewelry store first opened its doors 30 years ago and now it generates more revenue in Berkshire, on Berkshire weekend than the whole busy month of December. And then there's a quirky group called the Yellow Burkers that's been around in some form or another for 30 years and they still meet every year to talk shop. Two decades ago, our contributor Bob Miles had a book signing at the Dairy Queen that drew 50 or 80 or so people. He now has a whole two-day series of seminars, summits, and dinners that draw thousands and thousands of people from every state in the country and many uh, places abroad. Whitney Tilson of, of a company called Case Learning shares in his wonderful essay in this book how when he first went 20 years ago, he didn't know anybody and he felt very lonesome. And so starting the next year and every year since, he's hosted a party that's free that people come to get acquainted, we go, even though we know a lot of people, and it's just a sweet, wonderful thing. John Petrie and Joel Greenblatt tell their story about how when they founded the Value Investors Club 20 years ago, they gave out free copies of a book because they knew the audience would really love and appreciate it. 5,000 copies of this book. This is a very special story to me. Guess why? The book was the Buffett Essays. Uh, and they ordered it from me, and I went out to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, a nearby town where the book is printed, with my nephew and loaded up the U-Haul truck and drove it to the Coliseum, and where John and Joel handed out books from the back of the truck right next to the front door. This is obviously a long time ago. Uh, they tell in their story some very interesting twists on that tale that I'll save for them. One decade ago, as Max Sykes described in his chapter, Mario Gabelli started an annual a dinner that's become an annual event, co-sponsored with Columbia University. Just a, a, a relatively small number of people came that first year. Uh, more than 500 people show up at that every Friday night nowadays. Charlie Tian tells about he had the idea of developing a, a focus on people at the Berkshire meeting. People, and, and investors is people. And so uh, he's, he's got something called Guru Focus that meets at the Doubletree Hotel every Friday. He's already got a few hundred people showing up for that. Creighton University professor John Wingender regales us with his story about how Creighton came up with a, an event called the Value Investor Panel that they've had every, every Friday before the meeting that now draws 500 guests a year. 
The Berkshire managers say they attend partly to meet the other shareholders, but also to meet their fellow managers, and they love the merchandising. I showed you a picture of the bookworm. Multiply that by about 30. You've got all these vendors inside this Coliseum. There's another snapshot of the pampered chef. And the CEOs are out there with their employees selling to their fellow shareholders. It's an amazing spectacle. It awes everybody who attends. So all these events, here's a tribute to these guys. All these events and every essay in our book exude Berkshire culture. It, all of this reflects and explains why tens of thousands of people go back year after year. Robert Hagstrom, the best-selling author of one of the very best books about Warren Buffett's investment philosophy, puts it poignantly at the end. He's relating how he attends all these events and gatherings, talks about who he's met and the friends he's made, and then laments that as each comes to an end, nobody wants to leave. We, we think that's both a literal statement and a metaphorical one. We think Berkshire shareholders love the economic returns. We certainly do. Um, but they equally love these cultural aspects. And the two are closely related. Berkshire's economic success owes a great deal to its very special culture. And that very special culture owes a great deal to the shareholders. And so it's a virtuous circle. Excellent managers, excellent businesses, excellent shareholders. And sustaining that culture is vital. So the Warren Buffett shareholder is as important as whether Ajit or Greg or somebody else assumes Warren's role when he leaves the scene. Berkshire's unique quality requires great managers and great shareholders. And the good news is, judging by the content of this book and the people who've written for it, we've got them. Thank you very much. <laughs>